All right, welcome. Welcome to all the participants in our masterclass today. Um, I'm going to begin. There may be a few more people logging on, but let's get started. Welcome to the Israel Investment Advisors Masterclass from Startup Nation to Scale Up Nation, from strong foundations to potential for long-term growth. Well, now, of course, there we go. Get the technicalities working. You're about to discover the unique and fast growth story of Israel in the developed world. To quote Dan Sr., the author of the Startup Nation bestselling book, um, it is a story not just of talent, but of tenacity, of insatiable questioning of authority, of determined informality, combined with a unique attitude toward failure, teamwork, mission, risk, and cross-disciplinary creativity. The Israel as a Startup Nation story. Former President, the late Shimon Peres, starting with the Israeli mind, in Israel, a land lacking in natural resources, we learn to appreciate our greatest national advantage, our minds. Through creativity and innovation, we transformed barren deserts into flourishing fields and pioneered new frontiers in science and technology. So who is this masterclass for? Let me go through some of who will benefit from this class. American accredited investors with a pro-Israel mission. Experienced investors wanting to diversify their foreign portfolio. Savvy investors with a keen eye for foreign markets. Foundations that want to ensure their investment dollars are aligning with their core mission and values while fulfilling the highest level of tzedakah. Israel bondholders wanted to expand their long-term investments in Israel. Who is it not for? It's not for investors who are looking for short-term profits. It's not for investors who are looking for guaranteed returns. It's not for investors who see Israel only as an emerging economy. And it is especially not for investors who are skeptical of Israel's future and resilience. Get ready to learn about the extraordinary growth Israel has experienced over the last four decades, Israel's transition from startup to scale up nation, the opportunities behind the restructuring of the Israeli economy, and finally, impact investment as the highest form of tzedakah. What are the key takeaways? Align your investment dollars with your core values and learn how to expand your investment portfolio to the Israeli market. Now is the right time to deepen your impact. You are witnessing the transformation of the Israeli economy and the relationship between the Israeli and American Jewish communities. By learning about the major shifts in Israel over the last 30 years and analyzing the financial trends, you can realign your values and mission with Israel by supporting the upward movement from startup nation to scale up nation. Just briefly about myself. I'm an experienced portfolio manager, investment analyst, and economist. I've been actively investing in the Israeli markets for more than 30 years, and we founded Israel Investment Advisors 11 years ago to benefit from the burgeoning Israeli capital markets and to cater to clients who want to support Israel by investing in publicly traded Israeli companies. All right, who is ready to dive in and explore the Israeli market? I'm going to tell a story today in three parts. We're going to talk about Israel, not just as a technology startup, but as a startup nation, literally when it began and laid the seeds for what would later become a flourishing innovation and technology economy. We're going to talk about those early days and then how Israel eventually ran into a few ro uh, roadblocks along the way and had to restructure itself and uh, change the way that it operated and lay the foundation for what it is today, a modern, innovative, uh, dynamic economic story. So let's start at the beginning, planting the seeds of innovation, the extraordinary growth 
of Israel as a startup nation. Our story actually begins even before Israel was born in 1948. In fact, many of the uh, economic institutions that Israel still has today were actually created in the decades before Israel became a country. And if you go back through early Zionist history, through the early history of uh, the beginning of the Yeshuv, it was called the settlements uh, before Israel became a country, you have to remember that many of Israel's founding institutions were created by Zionist socialists. And so they set up essentially a state-run economic system. And despite the state orientation and the socialism of the early years, in many ways, it was very successful because Israel was a very, and the pre-state uh, Israeli economy was very small scale. What those institutions allowed the early settlers, the early pioneers to do was to establish a basic economic system. They created agriculture to feed the population. They overcame a lack of resources. They created social organizations that supported the market and supported economic activity. They helped promote and facilitate aliyah, meaning immigration. One of the key themes that we're gonna talk about over the next few minutes is population growth. Israel was a very, very small scale society in the early decades, especially in the 1920s and the 1930s. And many of those early socialist institutions actually functioned quite well for that small scale society and laid the foundation for future economic growth in the coming decades. Ultimately, it transformed from those humble beginnings to what it is today. The second largest number of startup companies in the world, discoveries of large natural gas resources offshore in the Mediterranean. And today, Israeli gross domestic product per capita is higher than in France, Japan, or Italy. That's the transformative story that we're going to discuss over the next 45 minutes. Of course, it was very far from linear. The story with hindsight has been a very strong story. GDP has steadily grown over the decades that Israel has been a state, and as I just mentioned, even from its pre-state time, but it wasn't linear, there were ups and downs. Overall, however, the story is a strong story. Let's go back to the early years of statehood in the 1950s and the 1960s. The dominant theme of those early years was the ingathering of the exiles. First, you had uh, the Holocaust survivors. So if you go back to 1948, Israel's population was about 600,000 people at that time when, when independence was declared. Within the first 24 months uh, following the declaration of statehood and the war of independence, another 600,000 Holocaust survivors uh, flooded into the country. And then again, in the 1950s and 1960s, as uh, immigrants from Arab and Muslim countries began to uh, flood in, the population um, grew very rapidly. Although the population grew, Israel's founding socialist economic institutions were able to absorb and, uh, albeit with a lag, the material and cater to the material circumstances of this rising population. However, it was still fundamentally a state driven economy. We'll talk a little bit about what that means, but that state driven economy ran into some serious problems in the late 1960s and early 1970s. As Israel grew from a very small population to a larger population of about 3 million people in the early 1970s, the socialist institutions from its founding began to creak and ultimately broke. And if you layer on top of that the heavy expenditures of the 1967 war, the 1973 war, 
the oil crisis in the wake of the 1973 war, global stagflation, economic growth around the world stagnated, inflation rose. Israel was not immune to those global trends. And if you, as I mentioned, include some of its domestic challenges, the system that was created at, at its birth began to crumble. Um, by 1983, in the early 1980s, Israel was in very deep trouble. And for those of you who visited Israel at that time, as I did, and my very first visit to Israel was actually in 1984, the inflation rate was approaching 500% at that time. Something had to be done. The system that the founders created was no longer working and it created a very serious economic problem. That problem came to a head in 1983 and 1984. To make a long story short, the financial system got into deep trouble and um, many of the banks had to find ways to finance themselves. And unfortunately, there was not very many good options. And uh, when they started to issue ever larger amounts of stock to the public, a lot of people don't realize that the Israeli stock exchange all goes back to the 1950s. And in fact, in the early 80s, partly because of this crisis, the uh, stock market in Israel was more active in the early 80s than it would be 10 or even 15 years later, because when the banks ultimately went bankrupt, the government had to nationalize all of them. And because the dominant banks, the big three in particular, Bank Hapoalim, Bank Leumi, and Israel Discount, controlled not just banking, but also securities, and in many ways, the pension system, what actually happened was a complete nationalization of the Israeli financial system at that time. And that uh, created panic and crisis, and as a result, the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange closed for 18 days. Think about what happened in the United States after September 11th, when the uh, US Stock Exchange closed for a week. That's how dramatic this period of time was. This crisis revealed major structural flaws in the Israeli financial system. Let me go back and just highlight what some of those structural flaws were. You know, I mentioned that at its founding, Israel was created along socialist lines. Well, in fact, it was a little more complicated than that. There was no state, obviously, when the British mandate, when the British ruled the mandate from the 1920s through 1948. But because uh, many of the founding fathers, like David Ben-Gurion, were ideological socialists, they set up labor unions. And the history of labor unionism in Israel is very different than the rest of the world. In the rest of the world, what happened was capitalists would set up business enterprises like the Vanderbilts and the Carnegies and the Rockefellers in the United States. And then their workers would try to organize to demand better working conditions and wages. That is not what happened in uh, pre-state Israel. No, there was an ideological commitment to labor unionism. So they created labor unions and then realized they didn't have any industrial enterprises. So the labor union became an entrepreneur. The labor union called the Histadrut set up most of Israel's major industries. In fact, many of the biggest companies to this day trace their roots to their Histadrut labor union origins. As a result, by the time Israel became a state in 1948, there were really three major pillars to its economy. There was the Histadrut sector, meaning the labor union sector. Then after 1948, the state established other state-owned enterprises. So there was the state sector. And that uh, each of those accounted for about one third each of the Israeli economy. And then there was a very small private sector, which accounted for the final third of Israeli uh, economic activity. So when this crisis came to a head in the 1980s, two thirds of the Israeli economy were controlled either by the state directly or through a quasi-state labor union 
called the Histadrut. So as a result, a political solution was required to solve this problem. And that led to the first uh, rotation government. We've, we now have a rotation government uh, that's been established. We'll see if it rotates. But back then in the 1980s, this was the first time this was attempted in Israeli politics successfully. And the two major political parties, the Labour and the Likud, came to an agreement. The agreement was that the time had come to drastically transform the Israeli economy from the basket case that it was, the state-driven uh, socialist economy it was, and start the gradual, emphasis on gradual transformation uh, towards a more orthodox economic policy uh, in terms of the budget, inflation, monetary policy, and a transition towards a private sector, more capitalist economy. It began, this stabilization period began the process of Israel's long climb out of distress toward economic success. They created something called the Economic Stabilization Plan, which was implemented in 1985. The goal at first was to curb hyperinflation, as I mentioned, approaching 500% per year. And in order to do that, they had to do a variety of things. They slashed the budget, they imposed wage and price controls, and they set up the Bank of Israel, the equivalent of their Federal Reserve, on an independent basis, so that they would stop printing money to fund budget deficits. Within two years, the inflation rate dropped first to 20%, and within a decade, it fell below 10%. Just to foreshadow some of our conversation in the next few minutes, the Israeli inflation rate is very low, one of the lowest in the world, very similar to the inflation rate that we had been experiencing in the United States over the last 20 years. That transition from a high inflation to a low inflation economy began as a result of the economic stabilization program in the 80s. They also, as part and parcel of the stabilization plan, began the recapitalization of the now nationalized banking system, meaning the state took over the entire banking system, but they didn't uh, eliminate banks as independent entities. They preserved the banks as operating companies, Bank Leomi, Bank Kapoalim, Israel Discount Bank in particular, that's the big three. At the time, they controlled 85% of all financial activity in the state of Israel. They recapitalized those banks and started the process of putting them on a firm financial foundation. In the 1990s, as the Israeli macroeconomy stabilized, the crisis receded. The government, and by the government, I mean all political parties. In fact, many of these policies I'm about to outline were started under labor governments, under Yitzhak Rabin, and they were continued under subsequent Likud governments. Much of the economic story that I'm about to discuss has national. Is there's a national consensus, there's a broad agreement in Israel regarding many of the policies that were implemented in the last 30 years or so. First, they began the long process of privatization. Starting with the banks, they began to sell uh, many of the banks to private investors and they used the stock exchange as one of the primary vehicles to float uh, stock in the nationalized banks, but because Israel was a small country, because it was a poor country uh, at that time. For example, uh, GDP per capita, gross domestic product per capita in the mid-1980s was $6,000. Just to give you a sense of scale, today the United States GDP per capita is $65,000 per person, and Israel is $40,000 per person. So back in the 80s, when the GDP per capita was only $6,000 per head, there wasn't a lot of wealth and there wasn't a lot of interest from foreign investors. So the privatization process, selling state-owned banks, selling Histadrut-owned companies took many, many years because in most cases they could not be sold all at one time. They had to be sold in bits and pieces when buyers could be found, very often listing uh, per small percentages on the stock exchange. At the same time, 
they began the transition towards a more deregulated economy, a less state directed economy. You might think of Israel as a democratic version of the former Soviet countries of Eastern Europe, like Poland, the Czech Republic. Many of the economic issues in Israel were very similar to those countries, but Israel did not have the burden of a, an authoritarian regime. It had the advantage of a democratic system and a British common law independent judiciary huge advantages in this process, uh, transitioning away from a socialist foundation towards what it is today. There was one sector which was like the Wild West, meaning it stood outside of all of this uh, socialist um, activity. And of course, that was the technology sector. In many ways, the technology sector, which were highly focused on as investors, of course, and the press, but it's not the whole story, as you will soon see. The high-tech sector had the benefit of growing up outside of the Israeli socialist system because much of the technology activity that we now know as the startup nation began in the 90s when Israel was on its way towards privatizing and deregulating. And so the high-tech sector was born in a more freewheeling free market envi environment right from the get-go. As a result, the high-tech sector has developed rapidly since the late 1990s, with freedom from overbearing government re regulations, free flow of capital and Israeli human capital, with a strong affinity toward technology, obviously resulting from some of the defense requirements, but not only that. Israel has become a powerhouse of technology, creating and selling it to major global companies. Okay, if we go back to some of that story that I said regarding the socialist foundations, the nationalization of the banking system, and the gradual transition that started in the 1990s towards a more private market system. And then you say, you combine that with, okay, you now have this flourishing technology sector that's starting to grow up in Israel. Well, there was a problem. And that problem still exists, although it's being alleviated each year. <clears throat> and that uh, in Israel has come to be known as the early exit problem. When um, investors invest in startup companies, what happens is, because the capital markets have historically been more limited, it's been difficult for Israeli companies to raise capital to the same degree as let's say their American counterparts. So as a result, instead of growing up into multinational corporations of their own accord, many of them are forced to sell to other larger companies too early. Israel has traditionally called this the early exit problem. And one of the reasons that we have become stock market investors is we think active investment in the Israeli stock market not only benefits the investor, but it also benefits Israel because it helps contribute to the liquidity and the capacity of the Israeli capital markets. And it's part and parcel of solving this early exit problem. Let's talk about why it's such a huge factor. Look at Facebook. Facebook went public in 2012 when it had 4,600 employees. Most people don't realize that because Facebook was able to raise large amounts of capital on the stock market and use publicly traded stock as its currency for acquisitions, its uh, employee base grew from 4,600 to almost 60,000, meaning most of Facebook's growth, most of its scale up occurred after it went public, not during the years of its startup. That is also the case um, for Israeli companies that do manage to gain enough capital through uh, publicly traded markets, but too few have that opportunity. In fact, we're gonna talk about why in 2021, um, some of that is starting to change largely because of more and more active involvement of investors like ourselves on the Israeli markets. Okay, let's talk about, as I mentioned, the restructuring of the Israeli economy from its socialist heritage 
on its way to what it has become today, a more free market economy. Just to recap, the economic stabilization plan of 1985 curbed Israel's hyperinflation by slashing spending, imposing wage and price controls, stopping the printing presses to fund uh, uh, budget deficits, and the current wave of restructuring uh, were facilitators of economic growth. And I'm gonna go through four key elements that have occurred in the decades since the economic stabilization plan that have really laid the foundation for ongoing economic growth and success. I've mentioned already privatization. Privatization began in the 90s. It accelerated in the late 90s. It accelerated even more in the early 2000s. Over, the year, over this period of time, from the early 90s through about 2010, Almost all economic activity in Israel transitioned away from the state sector and the Histadrut sector into the private sector. Israel still has some government-owned uh, businesses, but they tend to be now more limited to the defense sector. A little bit of legacy, for example, in the electricity generation area. But for the most part, Israel is now, instead of being a two-thirds uh, state-directed socialist economy, it's um, um, overwhelmingly a majority free market economy today, private sector economy. We're gonna talk about something called the Bahar Committee, the Concentration Committee and the Sturm Committee. Many of you are probably not familiar with these somewhat wonky uh, changes, but let me assure you, they are all major developments in the uh, history of Israel's economic development. Let's focus on privatization first. I'm gonna focus, there's a lot of privatization stories. I'm gonna focus primarily on bank privatization because that was the key to the transformation of the Israeli uh, economy. Obviously, in order to have a private sector economy, you need to have a private uh, financial system. So between 1993 and 2018, let that sink in for a minute. The last uh, privatization transaction was in 2018 when the government sold its last 5% of Bank Leomi. Um, and uh, that's why I mentioned it was a very gradual process. Most of the transition, however, occurred in the late 90s, meaning even the banks, even though it took them 25 years to privatize 100% of their shareholdings, uh, the, the control of the financial system shifted into private hands in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Very often these privatization transactions occurred on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Um, privatization was not just the shift of uh, companies from state ownership to private ownership. There was also a transition, a transformation of these companies as well uh, because the Histadrut owned all of them under a holding company. Um, they called it Chevrata Ovdim, the workers' company. So they broke up uh, the workers' company, Chevrata Ovdim, and sold various companies to different owners, such as, for example, Shikun Vibinui, one of the largest construction companies, Tanuva, the major dairy, Hamashpir, retail. If you travel to Israel today, these are all well-recognized brand names uh, that every Israeli is familiar with. They still exist. Most of them are now publicly traded on the stock market or have been privatized, in, uh, um, uh, but not traded. But most are now trading um, on the stock exchange. And, and it includes many other sectors, uh, retail, manufacturing, mobile telephony, et cetera. OK, privatization removed the state and the Istad group from dominant positions in economic life. However, there was a catch. Remember, each of these companies uh, particularly if we go all the way back to its roots, when in the pre-state period, the Histadrut set up many of the companies. Remember, it was a very small scale society. So there was only typically one company in every field, at most two. So almost every business that either the Histadrut had established before the state was created in 1948 or the Israeli government had established after 1948, almost every one of those businesses was a monopoly in its field. So when privatization occurred starting in the 1990s, 
most of those businesses could not be easily broken up because they were inefficiently run. They were often losing money. And as a result, they were privatized for very low prices, but the new owners retained in most cases monopolies in their industries. In the early days, those monopolies were not fully exploited in terms of prices because most of these companies were so poorly run. So even though they were monopolies and ultimately did create a whole category of monopolist gazillionaires, multimillionaires and billionaires, in the early days, these new owners had to put these companies on a more efficient basis, and they did. But they also exploited their monopoly advantages by raising prices, by stifling competition. So privatization in the 90s and early 2000s transitioned Israel from a state-run socialist economy to a monopolized private economy, albeit that monopolized private economy was much more efficient. Those companies became more profitable, in many cases too profitable. And as a result, it generated a reaction now in the 2010s to those monopoly businesses, which we're going to talk about in a minute. One of the first um, uh, reactions politically was called the Bahar Committee. So remember, as I just mentioned, the banks for, uh, controlled almost all financial activity in Israel, including deposits, lending, securities, pension management. The big three in particular, as I've mentioned, Bank Hapoalim, Bank Leumi, and Israel Discount Bank were um, controlled about 85% of all three of those major activities that I just mentioned, banking, securities, pension. So what the Israeli government did after privatization, they realized that now the banking system was heavily concentrated. They had created a few billionaires out of the privatization process. And those uh, owners acting as tycoons, that's what Israelis call them these days, tycoons, were stifling competition. So the Israeli government realized that in order to Im increase competition in the economy, they had to deal with the lack of competition in the financial system. So they passed their first law uh, called the Law for Encouragement of Competition and Reduction of Conflicts of Interest in the Israeli Capital Markets. This was named after the chairman of the committee investigating it, Yossi Bachar, of blessed memory, who recently died, uh, uh, I think he'll be remembered in Israeli history as a truly great man. Um, what this began was the breakup of banking from securities, from pension management, especially for the big three, and um, really launched our interest at Israel Investment Advisors in um, developing our fund because we knew the time had come that Israel was starting to put its financial system on a truly competitive footing. The Bihar reforms mandated that the three largest banks restrict their securities underwriting and investment banking activities, allowing uh, an, an independent uh, capital markets industry, investment banking industry, and securities industry to grow up. Um, they were forced to divest their pension fund and asset management operations. Most of those were sold to the insurance companies, which really empowered the insurance industry as a viable competitor to the banking system. Some were sold to uh, purely independent private um, pension managers, um, but most particularly Israel's five major insurance companies, Migdal, Klal, Harel, Phoenix, and Menorah, acquired the uh, pension management and became major uh, competitors to the big three Israeli banks at that time. As I mentioned, the Bahar legislation empowered the previously enfeebled investment banking industry. Israel now has a quite robust investment banking and securities industry. The roots of the strength, the roots of the industry go back all the way to the 50s. The roots of its current strength go back to the Bihar reforms in 2005. Okay, as I mentioned, the tycoons took over. That's what Israelis now call them. The, uh, during the privatization process, the banking system, they took over many of the privatized companies. And uh, the Israeli government realized that the economy was too concentrated, that this needed to be broken up. 
The Bihar reform, of course, was the first step uh, dealing with the financial sector. Um, in 2010, um, the Israeli government set up something called the Concentration Committee. Um, a lot of people don't realize this. It was actually established in 2010, but it, it gained life in 2011. If you remember during the Arab Spring, Israel had its own version when um, half a million Israelis took to the streets during what they called, they dubbed it the cottage cheese rebellion. I mentioned Tanuva. Tanuva was privatized and after its privatization, it raised prices, particularly on cottage cheese and other dairy products by as much as 40%. And that really sparked what became known as the cottage cheese rebellion against the high cost of living and the concentration of the Israeli economy. So even though the concentration committee was established in 2010, it really got uh, political life as a result of those protests. And so what did the concentration committee do? It made a series of recommendations that were ultimately embodied in another major transformative law called the Law for the Promotion of Competition and Reduction of Concentration. What this law did, if you really want to sum it up, was begin the same process in Israel that the United States went through in the early 20th century when we had uh, the trust busters like Teddy Roosevelt who went after the Rockefeller Standard Oil monopoly, et cetera. Israel is going through its progressive era. That's what it was called back then in the United States. It's going through its trust busting era now. We are living in the middle of this now, and it really has teeth. Starting with this law for the, uh, to break up the concentration of the Israeli economy, it really did two major things. It separated the ownership of financial and non-financial companies, meaning you could no longer own, for example, like the uh, Arison family owned Bank Hapoalim, and they also owned Shikun Vibinui, so they were both the largest lender and the largest borrower, this law broke that up. And the Arison family was uh, forced by this law to divest their holdings, both in Bank Apolim and in Shikun Vibinui. Uh, Bank Apolim is now fully widely held on and traded on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Shikun Vibinui has a new controlling shareholder, but also a fairly large listing on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. That's a, that's a similar type of law that we, in the United States, we had a similar law in the um, 1930s, I think it was passed, and we still live under that system today. And then secondarily, um, there were a lot of pyramids, they called them, controlling hierarchies of businesses through uh, building essentially interlocking business empires using their control over the financial system. And um, to a very great extent, this law has begun the unwinding of that system, injecting less concentration, fewer conflicts of interest, and more competition. Diversifying the ownership of many Israeli companies will benefit us and has benefited us because, obviously, many of these companies had to sell stock on the, pu on the public markets in order to meet the requirements of the law. And of course, more efficient capital markets, improved liquidity, and potentially higher valuations are the byproducts of the growing competition for capital. Um, many of the tycoons, even though they were forced to sell their empires and break them up, actually did fine because of what I just said. The valuations improved. They got more liquid um, resources. And as a result, these companies were put on a sounder footing with fewer conflicts of interest and uh, higher valuations. Many of, it's a, it's a process. We're still in the middle of that process. I don't want to lead you astray. This is not done, but we are well along. Since the passage of the law in 2013 is when it was actually passed through now, major changes have occurred, but we're still in the middle of this phase as we speak. Okay. As I mentioned, the Israeli government has taken a pro-competition stance all along the way since um, about 2005. So 
to double down on that or triple down, let's say, in 2017, there was another committee set up called the Sturm Committee to further study the concentration of the Israeli banking system. So even though the capital markets were separated from the Israeli banks, the insurance industry was empowered and separated from the Israeli banks, still the banking system itself, deposit taking and commercial lending was still dominated by only a handful of banks. As I mentioned, there's three big ones. To help increase competition, the Israeli government passed in 2017, the law for increasing competition and reducing concentration in the Israeli banking market, that ordered the two largest banks, Hapoalim and Bank Leomi, to divest their credit card subsidiaries, set them up as independent companies. And then uh, once those are independent, those two can grow up as independent banks. And once there's enough competition in the market, those, then Bank of Belim and Bank Leumi can get back into the credit card business. That occurred. In fact, Isracard, one of the major, uh, the largest credit card company is now a publicly traded company listed on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Once again, consumer credit is a more competitive industry, more dynamic, and uh, a lot of people don't realize this, because of the concentration of the Israeli credit card industry, um, credit cards, did, they were not the same in Israel as they are here. Credit was quite limited. The availability um, and the cost uh, were much more limited. And in fact, total consumer spending as a percentage of the economy are much lower in Israel as a result. All of that should change in a positive way as a result of this reform. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the future in the last few minutes that we have together and then a little bit about uh, our fund. Okay, the restructuring of the Israeli economy has left its mark on the entire financial system. And if we go all the way back to the 80s, when I mentioned Israel was a financial basket case, it had to get its house in order. Many of the reforms that were implemented in the 80s have continued. So Israel went from one of the most indebted countries in the world in the 80s to one of the least, in fact, it is the least, uh, it has the least debt of any developed country in the world. Just prior to COVID, the debt to GDP ratio in Israel was 60%. By comparison, in the United States, just prior to COVID, uh, we were about 85%. And even now, the United States, because of COVID, is well above 100%. Israel also did a much better job, even though it did have to increase its debt. Uh, due to all of the COVID-related shutdowns, it did not increase its debt by nearly the same scale as we did in the United States. It's, re it's remained a fiscally disciplined country. GDP growth, the growth of its economy has been faster over the last 10 or even the last 20 years uh, in Israel than in either the United States or the European Union. It's the fastest growing developed country in the world. Israel is a high tax country, but you might be surprised to learn that Israel has been steadily lowering its taxes. Obviously, as a socialist welfare state, taxes were very high in the uh, late 80s and the early 90s. And now they're uh, becoming more and more globally competitive. In fact, the corporate tax rate, which is relevant to us as shareholders, is 23%, about the same as the United States at the moment. Okay, the infrastructure for economic growth uh, is there. The infrastructure for Israel to be a major investment destination is there. Unfortunately, it's uh, largely ignored. It's ignored by most foreign investors as a small country, um, but it shouldn't be. Not only should it not be in, ignored on its own merits, meaning as I just outlined, the story, the macroeconomic story, the restructuring story is extremely robust. Uh, there's more than 500 publicly traded Israeli companies the, these days. Um, as I mentioned, there's an IPO boom underway right now. And um, it's really just the beginning of a uh, transformation, I would say, of the Israeli financial system that we as investors have been helping to facilitate for the last 11 years and is finally starting to gain momentum. With more participation of American investors who care about Israel, like us, 
Israel, Israeli companies could raise more capital from stock offerings. There would be greater liquidity for all investors and Israeli companies could solve the early exit problem and better live up to their global potential. Israel is unique. If we go back over the last decade and we say, okay, in the United States, how much money was raised by companies from venture capital for technology startups? The number was 647 billion. But the big money was raised on the stock market, 2.2 trillion dollars. Of course, the stock market aggregates the savings of millions of investors, that's the point. Israel, however, was different. There was more money raised uh, through venture capital than on the stock market. That makes no sense. It's a, a, a result of the fact that very few people are paying attention to this story. As I mentioned, the IPO boom that's currently underway in the United States has had some spillover into Israel. So to a certain extent, this is finally starting to change. But we've been doing this for 11 years, so we're really very much in the 11th inning. But there are now Israeli companies going public, both in the United States, on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange uh, this year that had a lot of trouble going public previously. But there are many, many, many more that could go public if there was more active investment uh, from foreign investors. And who will those foreign investors be if not us? And I want to remind you, what's the point? How can we, what is the impact of what we do? Capital markets is where the big money is raised to transform small scale startups to large scale, what we're calling scale ups. Once again, this is Facebook. Facebook is a vastly larger company today after it went public. It was a successful startup but it could not have achieved the scale that it currently has had it not been able to raise capital as it did on the public markets. As you can see, most of Facebook's growth has happened after it went public, not before. As I mentioned, the Israel story is from startup to scale up. The seeds were planted in the early years. It, it, there were some problems that required restructuring and transformation. Those problems uh, required um, the government uh, to address them. The government has been addressing them. It's not the end of the story. Israel's very far from per perfect. It's not yet uh, completely on free market grounds, but it is a long way down the road, very long way. So how can you take advantage of it? When most investors learn about these opportunities, we often get three reactions. The question is, which one are you? Are you the investigator? You search for reasons why this opportunity won't work for you. You keep doing more research. The information becomes overwhelming and you have paralysis by analysis. Or maybe you're the maybe someday kind of investor. You see the potential, you get excited, but you don't take immediate action because you're waiting for the right day, the right moment. But the, you never get the rewards because you wait too long. Or you're number three, what we call the contributor. You commit to investing, supporting, and advancing the Jewish legacy for yourself in Israel, and you are ready for this. We want to make it easy for you to be a number three. We don't want anything to hold you back from aligning your investment dollars with your core values and expanding your investment portfolio to the Israeli market. Investing in the Israeli stock market has a double bottom line. And you as a contributor are committed to a purpose. You have a sense of ownership for what you want to achieve and don't take no for an answer. Contributors aim for profitability, of course, while simultaneously incorporating their core mission into their investment portfolio. Contributors love to break new ground. They find different angles to provide solutions to every day and major challenges their community is facing and bridge the gap between impact and investment, business and philanthropy, mission and purpose. And whether you're an individual investor or you represent an endowment or a foundation, we have many of those investing with us as well. We believe that this is a mission-related investment. Of course, Israel, the goal is rate of return, just like any portfolio invest in publicly traded stocks. But as we articulated, there's also a mission. 
The mission is to help the Israeli economy scale up and capital through the capital markets is how our savings and our capital is aggregated to allow that scale up to occur. Impact investing, like we're discussing here, is the highest form of tzedakah. A lot of people aren't completely familiar with Maimonides and his work, but they are familiar with uh, his hierarchy of, of charity, of tzedakah. And most people think that the highest level is when a giver is anonymous and gives generously to those in need, anonymously. That is not the highest level of tzedakah even by Maimonides all those centuries ago. No, in his Mishnah Torah, he said that the highest form is when the giver is entering into a partnership with a fellow Jew in order to afford him independence and autonomy, business partnership. In the modern 21st century world, what does that mean? We believe it means uh, joining and pooling our capital with uh, the people in Israel through the stock market. That is how it's done in the modern world. And we believe we are entering into partnership with Israel to help transform from startup nation to scale up nation. Whether you are an individual or you invest uh, on behalf of a foundation, we believe your impact is your legacy and your commitment to your purpose, your core mission and your action oriented um, spirit that is shaping the world around you you can be one of the leaders opening the door for your vision of prosperity. This is why we offer you an opportunity to expand your core values into your investment portfolio. And you can call Amy Kaufman. She is our Director of Investor Relations. When you call Amy, this is what's going to happen. If you are an accredited investor, first of all, she'll explain to you what is an accredited investor. We can only accept accredited investors. That's according to the regulatory system in the United States. Um, she will answer any questions. You'll learn about the feasibility of investing in Israel, how it all works. Here are the regulatory requirements to document your accredited investor status. Once again, a regulatory requirement and get an explanation of the required legal documents and process to fund your investment. After this masterclass, You'll receive a follow-up email with details about booking your call with Amy. She will reach out to you with available spots and you can book an appointment to discuss um, whatever questions you may have. Uh, of course, we have limited capacity. Once again, that's the nature of um, the type of fund that we have, a limited partnership. Um, so I suggest acting now if you have some interest. Um, there is some limited capacity. Let me um, open up for uh, questions right now and um, go ahead and submit. I probably should have said this at the beginning, submit questions through the uh, Q and A and hearing no questions. Um, I have a few that are commonly asked. Oh, here's a question. Okay, good. Yes, that's one of our commonly asked questions. So let's just take a look. Why did we start the IIF and why did we start it in 2010? Well, um, a lot of people don't realize um, there's a bit of uh, wonkiness to this. Israel was um, invited to join an international organization in 2010 called the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. It's sort of the club of rich democracies. And um, when the major index companies like S&P, MSCI saw that, they upgraded Israel to developed country status. Well, that was a mixed blessing. It's nice to be considered a developed country rather than an emerging market, meaning you've emerged. However, uh, Israel was a fairly decent percentage of the emerging markets index. And there's a lot of money around the world that is tied to these indexes. And when it shifted to the developed country index, it was a very tiny percentage. And in fact, very few companies in Israel made the cut for inclusion in the index. So to a great extent, Israel um, was divested from, not because of political reasons or BDS, but just because of this switch. And we knew the time had come because if we didn't um, jump in, we had this background and I personally had this background stretching for decades. 
Once again, I said, if not me, then who? If not us, then who? And as a result, we set up Israel Investment Advisors and the Israel Investment Fund, and we launched it in 2010 because that's when um, Israel was removed. The Israeli stock market was removed from the MSCI indexes. Um, we talked about who can invest, accredited investors. When you call Amy, she'll explain that. And um, what's our minimum investment? Right now, it's $100,000. Um, and Amy will go through that. Obviously, um, we'd prefer if we could lower that, but we can't just because of the economics of how these things work. So for accredited investors with a minimum of $100,000, um, please book your call with Amy and she can discuss the details. Um, with that, seeing no other questions, um, I thank you for your time. And uh, we look forward to talking with you and anybody that has interest in much greater depth. Thank you very much.